episode 12. However miserable he has been here, however unwelcome, however badly treated, you have at least grudgingly allowed him house room. This magic will cease to operate the moment that Harry turns 17. In other words, at the moment he becomes a man. I ask only this, that you allow Harry to return once more to this house before his 17th birthday, which will ensure that the protection continues until that time. None of the Dursleys said anything. Dudley was frowning slightly, as though he was still trying to work out when he had ever been mistreated. Uncle Vernon looked as though he had something stuck in his throat. Aunt Petunia, however, was oddly flushed. Well, Harry, time for us to be off, said Dumbledore at last, standing up and straightening his long black cloak. Until we meet again he said to the Dursleys, who looked as though that moment could wait forever as far as they were concerned. And after doffing his hat, he swept from the room. Bye, said Harry hastily to the Dursleys and followed Dumbledore, who paused beside Harry's trunk, upon which Hedwig's cage was perched. We do not want to be encumbered by these just now, he said, pulling out his wand again. I shall send them to the burrow to await us there. However, I would like you to bring your invisibility cloak, just in case. Harry extracted his cloak from his trunk with some difficulty, trying not to show Dumbledore the mess within. When he had stuffed it into an inside pocket of his jacket, Dumbledore waved his wand and the trunk, cage, and Hedwig vanished. Dumbledore then waved his wand again, and the front door opened onto cool, misty darkness. And now, Harry, let us step out into the night and pursue that flighty temptress adventure. Chapter 4 Horace Slughorn Despite the fact that he had spent every waking moment of the past few days hoping desperately that Dumbledore would indeed come to fetch him, Harry felt distinctly awkward as they set off down Privet Drive together. He had never had a proper conversation with the headmaster outside of Hogwarts before. There was usually a desk between them. The memory of their last face-to-face -face encounter kept intruding, too, and it rather heightened Harry's sense of embarrassment. He had shouted a lot on that occasion, not to mention done his best to smash several of Dumbledore's most prized possessions. Dumbledore, however, seemed completely relaxed. "'Keep your wand at the ready, Harry,' he said brightly. "'But I thought I'm not allowed to use magic outside school, sir.' If there is an attack, said Dumbledore, I give you permission to use any counter jinx or curse that might occur to you. However, I do not think you need to worry about being attacked tonight. Why not, sir? You are with me, said Dumbledore simply. This will do, Harry. He came to an abrupt halt at the end of Privet Drive. You have not, of course, passed your apparition test, he said. No, said Harry. I, I thought you had to be seventeen. You do, said Dumbledore. So you will need to hold on to my arm very tightly. Uh, my left, if you don't mind. As you have noticed, my wand arm is a little fragile at the moment. Harry gripped Dumbledore's proffered forearm. Very good, said Dumbledore. Well, here we go. Harry felt Dumbledore's arm twist away from him and redoubled his grip. The next thing he knew, everything went black. He was being pressed very hard from all directions. He could not breathe. There were iron bands tightening around his chest. His eyeballs were being forced back into his head. His eardrums were being pushed deeper into his skull. And then... He gulped great lungfuls of cold night air and opened his streaming eyes. 
He felt as though he had just been forced through a very tight rubber tube. It was a few seconds before he realized that Privet Drive had vanished. He and Dumbledore were now standing in what appeared to be a deserted village square, in the center of which stood an old war memorial and a few benches. His comprehension catching up with his senses, Harry realized that he had just apparated for the first time in his life. Are you all right? said Dumbledore, looking down at him solicitously. The sensation does take some getting used to. I'm fine, said Harry, rubbing his ears, which felt as though they had left Privet Drive rather reluctantly. But I think I might prefer brooms. Dumbledore smiled, drew his traveling cloak a little more tightly around his neck and said, this way. He set off at a brisk pace, past an empty inn and a few houses. According to a clock on a nearby church, it was almost midnight. So, tell me, Harry, said Dumbledore, your scar, has it been hurting at all? Harry raised a hand unconsciously to his forehead and rubbed the lightning-shaped mark. No, he said, and I've been wondering about that. I thought it would be burning all the time now Voldemort's getting so powerful again. He glanced up at Dumbledore and saw that he was wearing a satisfied expression. I, on the other hand, thought otherwise, said Dumbledore. Lord Voldemort has finally realized the dangerous access to his thoughts and feelings you have been enjoying. It appears that he is now employing occlumency against you. Well, I'm not complaining, said Harry, who missed neither the disturbing dreams nor the startling flashes of insight into Voldemort's mind. They turned a corner, passing a telephone box and a bus shelter. Harry looked sideways at Dumbledore again. Professor? Harry? Uh, where exactly are we? This, Harry, is the charming village of Budley Babbitton. And... What are we doing here? Ah, yes, of course, I haven't told you, said Dumbledore. Well, I have lost count of the number of times I have said this in recent years, but we are once again one member of staff short. We are here to persuade an old colleague of mine to come out of retirement and return to Hogwarts. How can I help with that, sir? Oh, I... I think we'll find a use for you, said Dumbledore vaguely. Left here, Harry. They proceeded up a steep, narrow street lined with houses. All the windows were dark. The odd chill that had lain over Privet Drive for two weeks persisted here, too. Thinking of Dementors, Harry cast a look over his shoulder and grasped his wand reassuringly in his pocket. Professor, why couldn't we just apparate directly into your old colleague's house? Because it would be quite as rude as kicking down the front door, said Dumbledore. Courtesy dictates that we offer fellow wizards the opportunity of denying us entry. In any case, most wizarding dwellings are magically protected from unwanted apparators. At Hogwarts, for instance... You can't apparate anywhere inside the buildings or grounds, said Harry quickly. Hermione Granger told me. And she is quite right. We turn left again. The church clock chimed midnight behind them. Harry wondered why Dumbledore did not consider it rude to call on his old colleague so late, but now that conversation had been established, he had more pressing questions to ask. Sir... I saw in the Daily Prophet that Fudge has been sacked. Correct, said Dumbledore, now turning up a steep side street. He has been replaced, as I'm sure you also saw, by Rufus Scrimgower, who used to be head of the Auror office. Is he... do you think he's good? asked Harry. An interesting question, said Dumbledore. He is able, certainly a more decisive and forceful personality than Cornelius. Yes, but I meant, I know what you meant, 